Star Trek The Next Generation was a show Star Trek The Next that Generation everybody was I interacted with. A show that I started watching when I was a really little kid. Can you believe it's been 30 years? Star Trek The Next Generation first Star Trek The Next Generation was my life. I really grew up with this show. My relationship to how I should conduct myself. It was the escape from reality. Welcome to Next Generation's First Generation, where Patrick Delmore and Sasha Shouties take a look back into their favorite childhood show, Star Trek The Next Generation. This is where we attempt to reconcile how we felt as children watching the show and looking back as old farts now in our late 30s, almost 40s. Social commentary and good old-fashioned shade throwing on our favorite and least favorite episodes. Here comes Patrick and Sasha. Check, baby, check, baby, one, two, three, four. Check, check baby, check, baby, baby, one, two, three. Stop trekking all the way with the wolf in the face of the folk town. What are you singing? <laughs> uh, it's, it's called Original Beats. No. Yes. No. Call no. Mr. Plow. That's my name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hello and welcome back to the third season of Next Generation's First Generation is Star Trek The Next Generation Watch Along Podcast. Today we are watching, holy cow, are we already on the fourth episode? Fifth. Fifth episode of season three of Next Generation's First Generation and it is... November? October 23rd. Oct- You're getting ready yeah. for Halloween. Yep, it's October 23rd of 2019. And this actually aired in 1989, 30 crazy years ago. Oh my goodness. George Bush the first was president. <laughs> He's no longer with us. Oh yeah, that's right. He passed away. He did. But uh, but the mem- the, the memories linger on, and tangentially, this episode is all about memories and how they affect us. This episode's really cool because it's really a Wesley episode, it even is. though they make it about another child who dies. So uh, I think it's really interesting, and I'll, I'll bring this. Spoiler: The child oh, dies. No, not a child, a parent. Oh. Um, and this is this is something that Star Trek uh, is pretty well known for is that all their main characters just have these really terrible family histories. Yeah. So, so we'll get into that. So cue up your Netflix, DVD, CBS, uh, or just uh, whatever picture cube you happen to use. Hey, who are we and who are we watching this with? Oh, yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> well, I'm watching this with myself and I am me. Uh, my name is Sasha Shouties. I'm one of the co-hosts. We have... Uh, I'm Patrick Delmore. I'm the other co-host. Woo! And then we have... Matt. Yes! <laughs> our wonderful Matt. And then we have our exuberant... Jim! Yay! So we're watching this from the Netflix rather than from the DVD. So we have it paused at zero uh, zero zero, I believe. And after we count down, we're, we'll unpause it. Here we go. And five... Four, three, two, and one. There is our ship flying along. We're watching on the Netflix today, so everything's in HD, which means you can see the ensign's knuckle hair there. Yeah. While Harry he's knuckles t- and his, uh, his spray on gray. <laughs> yes. I wonder if Ronco had a contract with these guys. Ronco! No, not Ronco. What's the name of the spray on people? Yeah, well, yeah. Spishax. Oh, Spishax. No. Oh. It was Ronco. Uh, Ronco Peel. Right, but he didn't do, like, the spray on hair. Yeah, he did. So our away team is on the planet investigating the ruins of the Koinonians. 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 Right, and, and look at Troy. She's about to make a... I'm in danger, poop face. Yeah, she's waiting for the, for the, for the least <laughs> amount of time between when it happened. Another director's choice and not an actor's choice. I don't think that Patrick Stewart, if he heard that and was you know told this react, how he could tap the card would react, wouldn't just you know go you know Chief O'Brien, you know beam the team out. Instead, yeah, he just walks from what you know from one mark 
to the other mark. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, the direct because the director told him to. Yep. If you notice there, the sick bay did not have the ha- the hallway corridor there. Yeah. When Dr. Trecusher came running in. She just came in from the closet partition. How did uh, how did Deanna Troy know there was a uh, something was about to go wrong? She's empathic. Yeah, not so not psychic. The yeah. we'll, we'll get into that. Yeah. We'll get into that. So the explosion happened. Whoa. Mm-hmm. And she but it ha- it wouldn't have been quite as bad. Like, what's her name might have made, the lady might have made it. Hmm. I have a theory. So they're about to meet a, a, a magic space ghost, more or less. Uh, that it's not quite like you, but just enough to control their destiny. Just enough to be almost exactly like the guy they met in the Survivors. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. And so I'm thinking Troy picked up on her, and that's why she got the advance notice. Anyway, so this is now October 23rd, 1989. You are getting ready for, for I almost said Christmas, Halloween, putting up those decorations, getting ready for the kitties, almost. This episode um, was directed by Winrich Colby. Uh, Winrich Colby. Winrich Colby. Written by Donald Moore. Featured music by Dennis McCarthy. Donald Moore, not Ronald Moore. Ronald Moore. Ronald D. Ronald D. Moore. The creator of the... Um Return of Battlestar Galactica, Ronald D. Moore. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Holy smokes. So Marvin Rush did the cinematography. And we have Susan Powell as uh, one of the guests. Uh, Gabriel Damon as Jeremy Astor, the young kid, who is also in RoboCop 2. Yes, he is. Yes. Awesome. And, of course, our good friend, Cole Meany. Is there really somebody named Susan Powell in there? Yep. Not the same Italian murderess that got off of uh, her charges, Susan uh, Susan Powell. But that's not, no, that's uh, Lacey. What's her face? Oh no, that's the Susan Powell is the the, the kidnapped lady that disappeared. Susan Cox Powell. Oh yeah, that's right. So uh, complete obscure uh, news that what we're talking about. It's a big local story here in the Pacific Northwest. So anyway, uh, people are looking pretty torn up. They're in the sick bay. Worf just looks awesome. I mean, that right there just looks like he had some prideful battle, even though it was a landmine. See, in, in Dominion War, he should have had some of that makeup done. That would have looked great. We still didn't know Klingons had pink blood yet. Yeah. Oh. He, he takes something for that. He he, yeah. he he takes the the like you know how you have bluing for your jeans. He yes. got he drinks a bottle of red every day. <laughs> bottle of white, whatever kind of mood he's in tonight. Mm-hmm. So Troy's bringing up the bad news that the the child of this dead away member is now parentless. In class, I reminded the teacher to expect. He's got an aunt and uncle living in Irving Glam somewhere. Hmm. I must accompany you. See, Worf just kind of literally shoved Dr. Crusher aside. This is, this is super weird because it's like Worf, because Worf's parents were also killed, he wants to do this ritual with this kid. Oh, well, that's where the title. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Well, that's where the title yeah, of the, the episode bonding. comes from. Oh. That is not a flattering uniform on Deanna Troy. She's never worn a flattering uniform. I like she her. looks good in the later in the duty uniform. I, I agree. agree. Uh, Jellico made her do that. Yeah, right? and he had a point. We'll He's like, yeah, this is a years. lounge. This is a military ship. Please put a uniform so, on. So here's the most. I think authentic acting I've ever seen from Will Wheaton you know, is in this episode. You know what the most authentic acting I've ever seen Will Wheaton do? What's that? For him to pretend there was a leech on his penis and uh, oh, stand by stand me. By me? Yeah. Oh man! You never know. I've never actually seen Stand by Me. It's good. Oh. How do you get used to it? How do you get used to telling people... Both of their hair is so swoosh right now. <laughs> Data's sitting there just yeah, got this look right. in his face like, 
Why is it, why is it my hair is swoosh as right right? So when I, well, it's obvious where we can go to show who's gonna go the same barber on the Enterprise that yeah. uh, Riker does. Before. When I when I first saw the scene with Kit Moore standing next to the candle, the way it was shot, I thought the candle like was a lighthouse in the back oh. distance, and that he was on like the holodeck. But no, he's just chilling in front of a blue screen. Is he gonna lick that knife now? <laughs> he might. I think that before I've said this before, but I think that. Before Mott the Barber joined the crew, they just had a fantastic Sam selling uh, the Enterprise. <laughs> this is a really quiet uh, turbo lift ride. I'm I think he it. called for a halt. There it is. So this is where everyone has to visit why do we have children on a starship? This is some Yeah, it's a good really good question. The, this is something that's always really bugged John Luke. Uh, it's it's the vulnerability, like the the value of having a fa- your family close is not worth the risk of putting them at danger every this, couple of episodes. This speech plays really well with if you believe that uh, the autobiography of Captain John Luke Picard is canon. He just came off a ship where he had to deal with like two pretty crappy kids. Oh yeah, yeah. Who were like the son? Who were the sons of the captain that he succeeded? That's right. It's funny because there is a cartoon stripper, Troy and Riker were interviewing teachers, and the teacher got the job, and, the, and he comes back and says, all your kids have PTSD, what's yeah. going on? And then they just list, list off like five or ten encounters that they had in the last week. Oh, <laughs> we got shot at, we almost blew up, oh, and that one guy hijacked our ship. Then the other guy hijacked our ship. And the Ferengi hijacked our ship. Oh, and then Data went crazy. Oh, and the, hijacked our ship. <laughs> and the kids were playing on the holodeck, and the holodeck tried to kill them. And then the holodeck hijacked our ship. Hey, that was an episode. <laughs> How many episodes did the holodeck so, hijack the ship? I think two. Yeah, yeah. Moriarty and Moriarty did it twice. Yeah. So three times. Moriarty did it twice, and he and uh, when Enterprise had its baby. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's on the DVDs, but um, there's a pretty significant deleted scene from this episode. This is actually a shorter episode. The whole There's a whole part where they show up in his classroom and talk to his teacher before they talk to him that was filmed. Oh, I yeah. would have loved to see that. Yeah, and it's, it's out there. I'm indifferent. So, uh, Matt, you were saying something about this young man. He was what did he do in Robocop? Too? He was the drug lord who basically got people hooked on narcotics and then, you know, shot up a bunch of cops and other gangsters and people. And then, oh my gosh, got blown away by Robocop Two. So in Robocop Two, is it Robocop 2? I mean, it's not the same Robocop. It's the second Robocop. It's Robocop versus Robocop 2. It, it's oh, like okay. the weird mech warrior. Like Robocop, Robocop 2.0. Oh, okay. Yeah. I see. So here we saw something very out of character for John Luke. He showed empathy and support to a child, which is clear. They try to make it clear that he, he doesn't like children, but that doesn't mean they have to suffer. He very much wants to support them. Riker's drinking a, 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 a moxicillin cocktail. Yeah. Baby, your medicine. What what kind of time did you spend with her, Commander? I will let you know. Why do you ask? Will you just ask me? This is a great conversation. Why do you ask the question? Since her death. This is a real, like, data as autistic person. That you're supposed to ask everybody if somebody dies how well they knew them. Which is true. It's a weird question. It really is a weird question to ask. Well, you think by now he would have had some experience with grieving? I mean, they even brought up Well, they're talking Tasha. about Tasha, but they all knew how well they knew, they knew Tasha. Because they worked with her every day. Mm-hmm. Because this woman that died... Um, it was a Lower Decks character. She was a Lower Decks character, but she wasn't an officer. She was the, um, they said she was the, uh, what is it, archaeology officer. Yeah, but if you look at her, I don't think she was higher than, much higher than a lieutenant. Yeah. What I like about this is everybody looks at their own 
story of death. So Riker, Riker's burden is that he's seen too many people die. It's interesting how this ship works, though, because they have ten yeah. forward, where essentially you go in there and everybody is equal. Yeah. They don't have an officer's mess. That's right. Like O'Brien, could, could O'Brien we've seen O'Brien eating with the officers and they're, they're, they, act, they treat each other. They do, like, rank is dropped in there. Except then you have, then you have lower decks, where you have, like, the junior officers are all sitting there and... Like, can't approach Troy and Riker at all. Well, now, yeah. but that's different. So, Riker is the first officer. So, yeah. that's, you know, you could go up and Miles could talk to, to Jordy because he works with Jordy. Yeah. And Worf is just a lieutenant. He, even though he's, say, a security chief, he's he's a relatively low ranking officer. In fact, I'm surprised he's a security chief on a flagship as a lieutenant. Takes the entire series for him to become a lieutenant commander. Mm-hmm. Why are they in the computer core right now? Like they built the set and they decided to. Hey, we need to use it more than once. This is this is something they loved to do in uh, the original series. Is that kind of latticed something in front of a shot where people are talking? But we just saw in the scene previous what what the device was that hurt um, the Mrs. Aster. So Worf's upset because. Someone under his command died senselessly. Like, it wasn't in battle. There was no honor. It was... She was the last victim of a forgotten war. Yeah, well, it's more that he can't... Have, there's no way for him to avenge the death. Mm-hmm. If you die in honorable combat, and if you don't, then he's supposed... You know, you're supposed to be given the the right to go out and seek revenge. But it's one of those... These people have been dead for thousands of years. There's no one to get revenge on. But you see, Worf is really upset, too, because... He's. Don't call it that, Worf. <laughs> What's it called? I want to. I want to make Rosario with the boy. It's an ancient, I know. It's an yeah, ancient it'd be Italian. Like, it'd be like Worf. The boy's probably already eaten. Yeah, I know. It's an ancient Italian noodle recipe. It's really great. So, so we're striking on the meat of the conversation here. Is that Worf says, "I'm an orphan. This boy is a, an orphan. I want. We have something similar, and someone needs to take care of this child." And I find it very interesting that Worf is really imposing himself into the situation to take care of the well well being of this child. Now, with Worf's backstory, if you remember, uh, his parents were killed on the Kinnamary Starbase when they were attacked by Romulans and. I think Worf was one of the few survivors. Yes, like there was, was only... adopted by a human, mm-hmm. and there was a there is a couple of people who survived, but no one of significance. And he was up, adopted by humans, raised out of the Klingon culture. We know the story. Um, but Worf is a, a sensitive person. Where if you can find ceremony to connect with your emotions, he's going to take advantage of that. He won't just informally come up to somebody and say, "Hey, how you doing, buddy? Mm-hmm. I know you've been through a lot." He's a sensitive soul, but he seems he seems thick skinned. He has to. He can only show his sensitivity through ceremony. And it hurts when his friends won't stand downwind. Did this kid get brought back as Riker's child? No, he looks. He's wearing the same outfit. Yeah. He really is. It's and the other thing was like I started to watch this. And it's so... Well, even this part is similar to the episode you're thinking of with the video of the family, because that plays into that episode about Riker. But um, I was thinking this was the this was the kid that thinks that he's an android. Yeah. Do you remember that one? I do yeah, remember so, that one. So, so, I want to, so they're looking at these home movies, right? And the dad is dead. No, the dad filmed them before he died. Or the, But the kid looks exactly the same age as those. But again, they're on Earth. They say, they say that house that they're in is on Earth. So it I, could have been his aunt, the, his aunt or his uncle that was filming it. Starfleet oh, actually yes. gives anti-aging drugs to all the children. The board I, otherwise, stations. everybody would look like Admiral Iguana. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow, smart kid. Well, there's a good chance you've never seen a Klingon in Starfleet. That's good. Yeah, yeah, but still, was, but like when someone walks into the house, you're an Asian, aren't you? Like you're <laughs> yeah, what the hell? you say that, but when I was in Eastern Europe, there were a lot of people who had never seen an Asian, not in, in person. person. Okay, I buy that. I mean, Jim, when we went to the 
to Germany, yeah. people kept on asking if you're Chinese, and we're like, no, yeah. Filipino. Yeah, there yeah. were people yeah. who had never yeah. met an Asian person in, in you know, in, in, you know, I was in, in, in Estonia and Lithuania and Latvia. They mm. never met in person an Asian. Mm. So anyway, these two are. They're talking about the meaning of what it's to be an orphan. Orph is really pushing hard the whole, you've never met me, but let's connect on a very intimate level on on our grief. And hey, that's the thing. That I is, just met you, and uh, this is crazy. Yeah, but, <laughs> but there's this bonding. Here's my bat list. <laughs> yeah. Call me, baby. <laughs> what it is, again, it's his insistence on demanding that everybody, you know, conf- his way of com- dem- almost demanding that everybody conform to his Klingon beliefs. Yeah. It's like, why well, have a Klingon Troy, is, Troy like, is being very gentle about pushing back against this, where she's like, listen, you know. Yeah. It's, it's not that it's a bad idea at all. It's just that it might not be a good idea for Jeremy. You know, this is where I really think that they should have better typecast Deanna Troy, the character, as more of a social worker than a, a counselor. Well, that's kind of what she is. is she, it's, it's, it's counselor, psychologist, intermediary for the ship. But, but this is the only time you should really see Counselor Troy. Yeah. And during in the in the tail end of grief. Yeah, she's a grief counselor. She's doing grief counseling and she's doing, you know, and that kind of stuff. But why again, why she has to sit on the bridge to do this? I have no idea. Because she could read the enemy. Well, I just think about all the previous episodes where they bring in like large groups of people who have been displaced and everybody ignores them. I'm like, this is where Troy can do her best work, right there. Well, yeah, and that's what it is. But yeah, but no, you have her on the bridge, you know, when it just it just yeah, it seems I mean I, I realize why they did it, you know, for the yeah. writing style, but it's like it makes no functional sense. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really interesting how she said that everybody is kind of unique in their grief, but what they're even more unique about is their joy, and that that's where she finds her satisfaction in her role, is bringing yeah. her back to, to joy. Yep, Troy's sensing something, but it's like, it's like there's her, something down there, but I don't know mother, where it is or where it is. That's what's crazy. She, she resents her mother so much, but it's like... Yeah, who is Troy's counselor? Yeah. Yeah, like, who <laughs> talks to Troy about Waxana? Oh, uh, Riker. Oh. But Waxana would be so much better at making... I mean, and we, and we see this, too, later on, is that Waxana actually knows how to make people happy. Um, Troy, at the end of the day, all she's going to do is he'd be like, well, you know, what, you know, what do you want? But this is this is super important here. This is probably one of the yeah. biggest scenes. So they're trying to counsel Wesley into talking to Jeremy because his father was killed and Picard had to tell him. So and this is yeah, and this is a very. I think this is very inappropriate. Really? So you can clearly see he's not comfortable. With it. It's like we want you to go talk to this kid about the grief he went through, and they're not asking. Are you okay talking about this with other people? It's, no, you went through this. You need to go talk to this kid. You need to go and tell him how to get through this. And I do it. And nobody stops to ask, well, Wesley, are you okay talking about your dead, I mean, his, your, your, your dead father? Or is this something you want to talk about? I mean, for all they know, he maybe he hasn't come to terms. And, and, he, and he brings that up himself later is one of those things. And you can yeah. see he's really reluctant. Yeah. But they're all still like, and, and Troy should be able to sense that, that no, Wesley doesn't want to do this. He's not yet, he's never really vocalized his feelings about it. Well, they point out, or uh, Chris Honeywell, we were talking about this, and I agree with him, points out that they have to go through all of the stages of grief in this episode in 47 minutes. The anger, denial, you know, acceptance, all of that. It's got to go like boom, boom, boom. And it doesn't, it's not that quick. And that would, and if they had played it a, t- a little bit tighter than this, Wesley could have been, you know, the one to show him, you know, what the stages are. But instead, they're going to make Jeremy go through him with this alien creature. 
Yeah. What What's very important for Wes and for Beverly, they don't really talk about Beverly too much. She lost her husband in the line of duty, and she's very upset about that. I think this is the best way to say that when someone dies, everybody feels it, and every character is impacted in one way or another. Now, here's where it gets weird in sci-fi. Just watch this kid's face. I like the reflection in the pad. That's yeah. interesting. <laughs> Boo! Yeah, yeah no. there's his dead mother. Jack. Now, from this kid's point of view, if O'Brien had walked in and said, we recovered her by putting together her transporter pattern to just before <laughs> she died, you know, kids would probably buy into Technobabble to get away with just yeah. about anything because yeah. they know the technology is almost like magic, but they don't ex- understand exactly how it works. It's kind of like telling a kid, well, a fire extinguisher will put out a whole house and if B, it's on fire. And B, it's like, yeah, he's 12. And yeah, Worf came and checked on him and Picard and Troy came and checked on him. But he shouldn't be totally alone. They should have had him be somewhere where there were people. Yeah. Had it been like, you know, hey, why don't you, you know, go to 10 forward. We'll have... You know, replicate. You know, replicate you whatever you want. I'm sure you they know, would have found like a, a foster family to stay with. Yeah, even that. I mean, he goes to school. Some kid, some he must have friends would let him spend the night because his mom's dead. Yeah. Well, now here's the thing. We assume he's this really nice kid, but he could be the st- the school bully for all we know. Yeah. He could be a dick. Try. Doesn't doesn't matter. He's still he's still an he's emotional still agreed, person. But there are still people who may not be. You know, we we assume he's got all these friends and everybody yeah. likes him. But oh. you still you still wouldn't want to leave him completely alone. Um, no, but I mean, if he if he was the school bully, it would have been a good conversation for Worf and uh, and Troy to have. So here's uh, he's trying to make a connection. He's trying to make a bonding. He looks doubtful. Yeah, well, yeah, he doesn't really believe it. He's like, oh, I don't know, man. And I don't know if it was mentioned, but apparently Troy felt an alien presence, and they checked, and they're like, security says that we're fine. Mm-hmm. And Troy was like, no, there's an alien presence. I feel it. So. so if you look at the five stages of grief and loss, it's denial, isolation, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. Uh, and Seven stages. Huh? Oh. Yeah, well, like six. Five. Yeah, oh, five. denial and isolation is one. Oh. But he was very much isolated. I think they yeah. deliberately showed him alone in his quarters to demonstrate he's isolated. He's not angry yet. He's He jumped uh, straight to... Oh, he's kind of in denial still. But uh, this is a hardcore freak out on Worf level. I'm surprised he hasn't tried to fight her yet. Oh, it's because he's at least... So that is a logical thing there, why he hasn't. She's within arm's reach of the boy. Mm -hmm. So any aggressive move, that was where... That's actual training there. Greg Dwarf almost never displays any actual training. Where sometimes he'll stand behind the diplomat who gets shot. (laughs) Yeah, you know, or point his phaser at the view screen. But in that case, yeah, if the person is that close of a range to a hostage or a child that he can harm, no, you're not going to take an aggressive... Stance or move. Now, why Jeremy wants to beam down to the planet is kind of freaky. Planet. Schmanet. Janet. Really, there's not much he can do. Just follow him down the corridor. I'm loping along behind. Worse, the third wheel. Or fifth wheel. I like the expression on Troy's face there. It's like, am I doing my job correctly? Bloody hell. Does he say it? No. He doesn't. <laughs> O'Brien's like, um, did you guys do something and not tell me? And he's like, hot biscuits. What is she doing here? Right? Picard, Picard doesn't waste any time. He knows she's an imposter. What do you want? To take my child down to the 
come up with it. Uh, the war is my responsibility. But there's a water park there. We don't know. Uh, yeah, it's yeah, uh, it's where the Koinonians were from. Dark, yeah, it's Koinonian Thalaba. Yeah. Yeah. They never it's got like around to... The, the, it's the coin of phrase planet. I feel like it, it's the third planet of none of your business solar you system. Yeah, they have a name of the residents there. What's up, Pat? I feel like there every you time go. they say the name of the planet, you have to hear the Mario gig coins noise. <laughs> oh, no. See, now he's angry. I mean, that's really well, no, no. So for this, that's not the stage of grief. He's angry. He's angry. He got pulled away. Wesley is the one who's going to display the anger. The anger. Okay. And when he talked about how he was angry at Picard and blamed yeah. Picard, he's still angry at him. Well, he is. Yeah, and that's why this is one of the better. This is more of a better Wesley episode than anything else. Yeah. I have an idea. There's a. You don't uh, know what's down there. Holiday the program of the Whoa. Velveteen Rabbit. Why don't we do that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That'll teach you real. Oh my gosh, they're in their old house, like in the movies. On Earth, yeah. It's sad that they still have white sofas in the future. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe inher- they're still inherited. It's, it's like a, it's like a four hundred year old white sofa. <laughs> At least it doesn't have plastic over it. With a chia pet, they still have chia pets. <laughs> yeah. Chia. Oh, maybe it's not a chia pet. Man, the interior decorator is just terrible. Yeah, it looks like everybody's aunt's house from the eighties. I mean, like, you've got... Just nothing works the, the together. Clock from, from Cost Plus Imports. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I decided to show you where the weights us there. It's very interesting because... This this creature... Why not? That's the question there. <laughs> well, this, this creature has an ability to cr- manipulate the environment around it to make it... To make life however they want to but see it's, fit. It so sucks makes sense. Because it's like, I thought a lot about this episode afterwards. Yeah. Um, to, to spoil the ending, I mean, uh, um, Jeremy chooses the Enterprise. He chooses the bonding with Worf. But why would you? It's like, the, what he's, his, the, the illusion that his mom's giving him is is much better than the, rea- the, uh, the reality that is being presented. Your real mother just make all this appear? Have we decided, have it, has it been told whether or not that mother creature is bad or good yet? Uh, have she's you figured good. figured it out? She, she made all of the, uh, she made it so that when they went back to the planet to investigate, all of those devices, the one Jordy was showing, had come out of the ground and couldn't go off to hurt uh, anybody. That's why she's there is because she feels so bad because she's a remnant of this war that somebody else got hurt by it. Is it actually his mom then? No. Oh. No, it's 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 an imposter and that's why everyone's so freaked out. It's it's an imposter ghost alien that has bonded themselves to this child because she feels so guilty that the child's mom died. And what's what's really I know you just said that, Pat. It just he had like that missing yes. link at the very beginning. Yes. This this reminds I don't have a husband. <laughs> this reminds me of when Riker was asked to give up the powers of the Q, where he had to choose abstinence and real life consequences over shortcuts with power. Oh, there's a, there's a good uh, what if for you. It was like, yeah, you can give up the power of Q, but also you can't ever uh, consummate a relationship again. Huh. Like, well, looks like I'm going to cue it up. (laughs) Well, the reason why is that Jeremy is, in a way, being offered everything he ever wanted. And he, they have to tell him that he's got to... It's not everything he ever wanted. It's, um, it's the problem with him being, with him being 12 years old. It's that idea that, you know, that, that weird space. I mean, and I certainly experienced that the... The right before and during puberty, where you you wish that everything would just stay the way that it was, where you don't want mm-hmm. those changes to happen, and I don't think that the Enterprise crew does a very good job at all of saying, you know, no things are things are going to change for you, and that that is a positive thing. It's part of growing up. This they kid, don't, they don't really make the case. This kid that's playing Gabriel is forty three years old now. 
You mean it's playing Jeremy? Or er, yeah, Jeremy. Yeah, the 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 kid's name is the actor's name is Gabriel. I mean, it would have made more sense if he had had like, like say, a best friend on the ship, maybe a female best friend mm-hmm. who was like really like, what if you go, you know, if you go here, we're never going to be able to, you know. To take you know take that trip we were gonna take and you know we'll never we'll never talk again we we can't go back to this planet. What are you freaking out about, Sasha? Oh, I just realized that this this uh, child actor was also in Tailspin. What? Yeah, he was a voiceover in Tailspin. Just Anybody so significant? No, no it was probably just Bear Number Three. You know, oh. it's yeah. it's just some random they needed a person. So I kind wow, of, O'Brien is freaked out. Just bat it away, O'Brien. Oh, we got knocked over by blue lightning. This show loves its blue lightning. So why did the ship shake? I, I kind of missed that. Why did the ship shake? Because the yeah. blue lightning flew up from the planet. The shaky and ship went through the shields. Oh, uh, so you know how we did uh, Little Mermaid? In yeah. our uh, Shore Leaf series? Yes. Mr. Gabriel was in that. Huh. Yeah. In the Little Mermaid? Is he a yeah. significant voice or just an extra voice? I think he was in the I think he was in the uh, the miniseries from ninety three to ninety four. There's a miniseries of the Little Mermaid? Yes, there was. It's an animated series. I love going down the, the career the career uh, Rabbit hole. He's also in Baywatch. Okay, I'm going to stop reading this guy's bio now. <laughs> force fields. Those teeny little force fields. So there's this creature that's it's trying to get back onto the ship. They physically removed it from the ship. It's come back. Freak the I, hell out of O'Brien. I would love it oh, yeah. if Worf just had a jar to catch it in. <laughs> or like some kind of like metallic butterfly net with a bunch yeah. of gadgets on it that you just that's Jordy and Data that's rigged up. A Doctor Who thing. No, no, no. You just need a couple of ki- country kids in a mason jar, <laughs> and they'll catch that firefly. Yeah. We don't call them fireflies here. We call them flicker bugs. Yeah, where are those flicker Irish bugs. rednecks they had earlier? <laughs> right. Great force fields. They remade these in the HD version. He's still on the on the ship. What's his name? Uh, Dandelo or whatever the, the guy's name was from the, up the long ladder. <laughs> this also outside the captain's quarters set. They always show these weird little side windows with blinds in them. If you had if you had a corridor window in your quarters, would you open the blinds for anybody just to look in? We like living in an apartment. I guess. I mean, if you had exterior windows in a ship and you pull into a starbase somewhere... Everyone closes the blinds. Yeah, you never see blinds or curtains on those windows. I mean, what do you... You know, walk through your apart, you know, your, your quarters, and they're going to be like some Ferengi ship parked right next to you. Those lights are moving pretty fast there. It's red alert. It's looking over everything, Commander. Going to school. I love the Star Trek education. They tell you something and then they tell it to you again, but dumbed down. Yeah. So, Jordy is convinced that this beast or lightning thingy is learning the systems. Shut it down, Jordy. Get the axe and cut the cables. All right, they're back in the apartment, in the quarters. Broke into the old apartment. Oh, it's not just her. It's a community of spirits. Yeah, now she's talking in the... In the plural. Yeah. In the third person. The accident on the surface was caused by a remnant of an ancient and tragic era. Two species once shared this world... One of energy and one of matter. I did not know that. So it's a planet with with both corporeal and non corporeal entities sharing yep. the planet. And they decided to have a law. Ah. Uh. 
That makes a lot of sense. Yep. They have made this possible. They have made me possible. I appreciate your motives. But his mother is dead. You must learn to live with that. It kind of reminds me of the ignorant person who finds Bambi in the woods and decides to take it home and it's like, well, this poor little baby deer just can't survive without its mother. We're going to give it, a, put it in a cardboard box and live in the backyard. And you hear these stories of people who just pluck wildlife up off the side of the road and the the consequences are always really terrible for the, for the poor animal. Yeah. Whereas this entity is really well intentioned, but the problem is they, it's kind of my way is the right way, so don't talk to me. And Picard's, all he can really do is talk his way out of the situation. He is alone now in your world, a child alone. How can this guy has the weirdest expressions on his face? He does, yeah. Is that a butt sculpture in the back? It sure looks like it. <laughs> Can you imagine like, if your parents' whole thing was just collecting erotic art and displaying it? Finally, yeah. Finally, we're getting into the good conversation. Yeah. What are you going to do for Jeremy when, when he needs friends, a job, a partner... How are you going to accommodate for this person who lives in a social world? Do you honestly believe you would be happy in this total fiction? A lot of people would be happy in total fiction. Totally. If you could create your environment around you 100% of the time, wouldn't you take advantage of that? That's something I feel like they don't get into in the Matrix enough, is that... Because it's the collective unconscious, it's like just a more dull version of the real world for most people no. in the Matrix. Yeah. Um, I mean, they get into it a little bit in, in Animatrix that like the really uh, you know, hyper-intelligent people have found fixes for that and mm-hmm. actually can do really amazing stuff. Why is it Troy doing? I feel like Picard is doing Troy's job. Yeah, she... She's having a heck of a time figuring out what she's supposed to do. And Marina Sturgis is actually acting that really well, whereas where the dialogue isn't saying it. If you look at her face in a lot of the scenes, like where she went back to confront, to talk to Jeremy, and then, you know, she hugged him at the end, she was just like, the whole time, she's just like, I don't know if I'm doing the right thing. So here's. This is what's important here. Yeah. Wesley's about to spill the beans, so they brought in Wesley to the entity and says, Hey, you know, Wesley's father died on a mission. The day I told you your father had been killed. As I recall, Wesley, you took you very well. No, he didn't. My parents had told me about the dangers of Starfleet missions. I knew what could happen. So you were prepared? No, I wasn't prepared at all. How can anyone... Be prepared to hear that a parent is never coming home again. This poor kid, he's thinking it over. You can see it on his face, listening to Wesley talking about what it's like to be alone. And, you know, and importantly, Wesley's only five years older than him. Mm-hmm. How old was Wesley? Uh, eight? When when that happened? I don't remember. It said younger than this kid here, so the kid's 12, so it could be anything. Yeah. In, in true in true group therapy, you'll want the person to talk yeah, way is... more than everybody else who's angry at him. Yeah. Why were you angry at me, Wesley? Were you angry at me because I was the one who told That's mind reading. Yeah. That's not good therapy. And why? He's not a counselor. I know. He's the Captain Picard. You came home and my father didn't. That's right. Yeah, that's it, why I didn't sh- want to talk with people about this. It should have been you who died, not yeah. my dad. Not anymore, sir. Well, then I'm surprised the young kid, uh, Jeremy, is angry at Commander Riker. No, uh, Lieutenant yeah, Worf. Maybe that's why he didn't want to bond with them earlier. 
Um, He's still in a state of shock. Well, at this that's point. what Charlie was just saying. Mm-hmm. Was that was that you must be angry for at work for exactly what you were saying? Yeah, and he may end up being angry at work point, but at that's this a point, good he's cry. Still in shock. That's a good acting cry that kid's doing. Your mother didn't. Why? Why weren't you going to die? Why did it have to be her? He can't answer that. You could have let him say that. Yeah. Worf, Worf can... Worf can stand for himself. You know, when I well, watch... He can. When when I watched this, this episode made me really think about all the characters' backstories and how effed up everybody's backstory was. You got Data built by the crazy scientist whose brother turned evil. You've got the Worf whose parents died and... In this attack, you've got uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Riker, who was abandoned when he was what thirteen yeah. in the in, in Alaska. Uh, you've got Picard, where we don't really learn too much about Picard at this point, but he never really got along with his family. Uh, Troy hates her mom. Uh, got away from that as fast as possible. Uh, we've got Lavar, who lost both of his, his parents. parents. No, well, his mother's still alive right now. So his dad. They, they're both in here. Ben, I know Ben Vereen plays his dad. I can't remember. They're both still alive. alive. He's they're both just, still he was just born blind. Ah. Uh, we the only person's backstory we don't really know is Beverly. So yeah, her, her grandmother founded the colony. And oh, all, yeah. The and magic her candle. husband was killed. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so kind of glazed over that right, right, right there. I don't like the resolution of this episode because just through that five-minute talk-out session of Wesley coming to terms with him being angry at Picard, they transfer that they 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 do some counter-transference and they tell that kid why are you angry at Worf? And then of course the kid turns around and says, "Yes, I'm angry at Worf. Why wasn't you that died?" And then all of a sudden the spirit says, okay, I guess you guys got this. I'm out. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it makes me think of the, in uh, Miracle on 34th Street, the thing with the uh, the mall Santa Claus where he gets analyzed by the um, psychiatrist. He's like, well, what did the psychiatrist tell you? He's, well, he says that I have delusions of grandeur. Oh, well, I guess you, you might, you know. That and I hate my father. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But they do have this nice ceremony, so there is some healing. Um, Worf pledges his life to this kid, and then we never see him again. This would actually would have been a really good Alexander episode. But they're all he and Alexander are already bonded. Well, they're going to bond, but then the kid's going to go back to Earth to live with his aunt and uncle. Yeah, yeah. I don't think they introduced Alexander yet, have they? No, they no. have not. Yeah. Alexander hasn't been born yet. Boy, he grows up fast because when they introduce him, he's like, eat. Yeah, I know. <laughs> they just, Klingons have a fast metabolism. And that's the end. What happened? They that bond. kid learned Klingon pretty yeah. quickly. Yeah. He goes from, I don't understand, to... Perfectly pronouncing it. <laughs> well, boy, I don't know. Psychotherapy that is not psychotherapy. The the only good thing about this episode was Wesley came out and told Captain Picard he was angry that he should have died instead of his dad. And that's well. that's perfectly legit. It's the most honest acting we've seen from Will Wheaton in this show. Mostly because it has to deal with the feels and not academic performance. Actually, if you notice any episode where Wesley has to talk about what he feels, he always gets really edgy. So uh, I think it, it 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 opens the door a little bit where we want to we want to kind of dig further into Wes. Um, I, I'm kind of disappointed that we don't have good social worker uh, situ you know folks built in to do wraparound no, services kidding. for this kid and to leave him and leave him alone in the quarters like that well how how many background butt sculptures do you give it background butt sculptures i give it as many as we saw in that episode what? one out of five that was just I'm gonna terrible give it four out of five background butt sculptures so here's 
Here's why. I saw this episode, I was probably younger than the Jeremy character, but anytime there was a kid that was a main character, that locked me into the show. So it did become interesting, and that means that I got to think about, and you know, this is probably one of the goals of the episode, is you're a kid, and what would you imagine it would be like if your mom died, mm-hmm. and then, you know, another version of her came back. And so, I obviously didn't grow up on a starship, so my relationship with adults like that would have been, you know, through school. So it's like, imagining, like, okay, my mom's dead, and I'm stuck at school. Like, I'm sitting alone by myself in a classroom. Ah, uh, okay. Then, Mom show and then mom all of a sudden shows up again, and school like the principal is telling me that mom's Whoa. not mom's not real, but the real world is this school that I. My mind is blown. All of a yeah. sudden, I'm thinking about kids who've gone through like school shooting incidents. Yeah, and they have to relive that every yeah. time they go to school. Yeah. So Jeremy's got to relive. And he yeah, might but, grow up thinking like I can never be on a spaceship again. Yeah. Yeah. You just said. The, the whole thing about hiring the teacher just like all these kids on the Enterprise have PTSD. Mm-hmm. They do. Hmm. Wow. I th- I think that this has really turned me. I don't think family should be on a starship. Wow. But yeah, I, so so anyway, it it's not one of my it's not one of the best episodes, but it's an episode that that had me had me thinking like what what choice would I have made if I was that kid? And I think, you know, there are a few, only a few factors that would have kept me away from deciding to stay in the fantasy. Hmm. So yeah, four out, four out of five background butt arcs. I, I like it. Okay. Anybody else? I'm, I'm going to give it two. Two? Okay. Maybe two and a half. That's pretty generous. Just because it's it, it was that, that that last few minutes with Wesley. Is the whole captain's like Wesley? Back me up, and he's like, "Well, no, I'm kind of didn't want to do this, but since you forced me into it, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I, you know, I was always pissed about it with you." And it was Picard really kind of he didn't, he, 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 and Patrick Stewart didn't play it up. I would have played it up differently if I were the director and have him be a little, a little bit more uncomfortable, a little bit more. Well, I, that's that's not what I wanted you to say. I wanted you to back me up on this. You know, and, and be a little bit more surprised that Wesley was always angry at him. You know, and I harbored those feelings. Yeah. And well, he did show some shock on his face there. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I think that's Patrick's. But they, you know, it was one of those. In the way, the way it was, it looks like it was ripped. And it was supposed to be Picard says, "Well, I'm going to do this. And this is my example. See, Wesley, I'm correct, aren't I? Thank you." And then just keep going on, and Wesley kind of like, "Well, no, you're wrong." And, you know, and yeah, and there, was, there was a lot of stuff that was messed up with it. But no, that that whole again, it was one of Will Wheaton's better performances, and I think it built a little bit more credibility to the Wesley character. Mm-hmm. You know, they they've been always playing him up as this. I'm this. You know, I, I'm in love with Starfleet, and I'm this genius kid, and they never really talked about. Well, you know, yeah, he is. You know, he's a second generation Starfleet person, but. You know, he was just kind of forced into this life. It was he's doing what was expected of him. Oh, it's kind of like the army wife, for example. Yeah. Or, or kids, kids in the military. Kids in the military, not less the army. Well, usually the army wife, legally, if the spouse dies, is, you know, well, isn't expected to enlist on behalf of the husband. Oh, yeah, yeah. You get that with kids who. You know, military families where, you know, like my father was in the army, he's my grandfather, and so and so, like that. You have families where the kids feel pressured to join the military because they've got, you know, four generations. There's heritage there. Yeah, four generations have all served in the, you know, in the army or something like that. Okay. You know, a good percentage of my family was in the military. So it was one of those things, you know, it's. They always tell you, well, you know, you make your own decision, but you do feel a little bit of the pressure to. To enlist. Okay. And you, Jen? Um, I've been kind of turning this this episode over in my head. Um, I would probably give it a three and a half or a four um, out of the five stages of grief. Um, and 
it just, there's a lot of good questions that were raised that, that we didn't really discuss um, about Picard saying, you know, or not Picard, like Ghost Mom saying, what is so noble about sorrow? And Picard saying that it's part of the nature to feel both pain and joy. And that's that's what makes, you know, humanity, humanity, is that you, you, you feel that entire spectrum. Um, that's kind of the, the wonder of, of being human. And I thought that that was really interesting. And then um, in next gen, first gen fashion, if we're thinking about, well, you know, how we have approached this, how, me having not seen it, um, about 30 years ago. And I'm looking at this kid and I am commiserating with him a little bit, only because I remember, you know, like my dad was in Desert Storm and so many kids um, on the base and, you know, get hearing, you know, like, why would you be so irresponsible to be in the army and to have a family? Like, you shouldn't have a family. Like, you know the risks. You're going to leave behind your wife. You're going to leave behind your kids. What if, what if you do die? Um, and I remember when I was in uh, Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, and was it Chambersburg? And, uh, and a lot of us came from, a lot of us were army kids, army brats, and uh, the principal did come in and did tell one of the kids, hey, you know, your, your father passed away. What? In school? And in well, class? so what happened was the kid was taken out of class. Um, principal talked to him. Um, mom was there, obviously. And mom looked visibly upset, and then kid didn't come to school for like a week. Um, and then, and then he, he told us what happened. And so I was thinking a lot about that kid um, in this, during this episode. It's like, well, what would it feel like to have your, your parent taken away? And there's, there's some people that are like, you know, at least he died with honor, you know, serving the country, blah, 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 blah. Don't come at me, people. <laughs> um, and then Matt was talking about, you know, how you feel that pressure to, um, to join the military because you come from a long lineage of people in the military. And I think about me and my siblings, like my dad was in the military, my grandpa was in the military. We have a lot of friends and family that are in the military. Um, but I and my two brothers are like, we would never, never put our family through that. Knowing hell are we in the military because that was hell for us. That was hell for us to have our dad out at war and to experience that. So to, to put somebody else through that, we um, So yeah, uh, and so yeah, I just thought it raised a lot of interesting questions and it made me think about a lot of things. So I'm leaning maybe closer to a four than Wow, that's pretty deep. Uh, we Star Trek sees, sees a long, long line of damaged children, I hate to say, use the phrase, but they they go through trauma. Look at Jake Sisko in some of his episodes where oh, he confronts yeah. his dad. It's like, I'm getting tired of getting called down to sick bay mm. because something happened to you. Uh, you've got the kid that imitates Data who was found on this exploded ship. This poor gentleman here, uh, Jeremy. Uh I wanted to tie it back to the episode quickly and why it made sense and how it ended. So when we started the analysis, we're like, well, that's kind of weird. The space mom, the ghost mom just disappeared. Mm -hmm. And I realized listening to Matt and his analysis was that when Wesley broke script and just started telling Picard, you know, I'm angry at you. We're doing this now. And then Picard and Wesley were having a conversation. Then Troy prompted Jeremy to talk to Worf and have the conversation. What that did was it demonstrated to Ghost Mom that she was not needed to provide the emotional support. That there were people around to take care of the emotional needs of this child and address the very real trauma. But do you think it was her choice to go away? I or think it was. It was. So, so... So say she didn't. Say that it was completely left up to Jeremy. What do you think he picks? Does he pick Boy, the Enterprise or does he pick his... his I, I want to say that he might pick his mom. Mm -hmm. I, I really it's think... A, it's true, yeah, but he really could. See, the, mom, the mom's premise was this. We hurt this child. We felt guilty. 
and we need to take care of this child. Well, they, they hurt the child, but that was it's it was just all about guilt. She had good intentions. She's mm-hmm. like, I, I made this kid sad. It is now my job to make this kid happy. Yeah. Had they had they gone into a little bit more exploration of the character of Ghost Mom, saying, I get it, we cannot provide for the emotional welfare of this child, and you obviously can. I'm out. That would have actually tied it up a lot cleaner. Uh, but, you know, it's TV, and it's 40 minutes, and they've got to go through the whole grief cycle in, 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 in 40 minutes. So I might see her, like, saying, though, that, you know, I will provide his emotional support because I will make him happy and not need, uh, he won't need any emotional support. He'll never know fear again. Yeah, and, like, how... That'd be a big red flag for everybody in the room. Yep. He'll never know fear, he'll never know sadness again. So had they actually had this ghost mom sit through a real therapy session where he had a breakthrough Mm -hmm. and then demonstrate, well, Jeremy has learned how to cope with this or is learning how to cope with this. That would have been interesting. If he went back with you, he would have never resolved the death of his mother. Yeah, and the other big thing is, who is it? Who is it that never knows? Who is it really that never knows fear, sadness, and death? Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah. Well, this is a really deep episode, and I'd like to thank you guys for processing this with us. Um, So, like any stressful, traumatic event, uh, this is really good sci-fi. It it gave us a lot to talk about. It's funny, because originally I thought this was a pretty wonky episode, but, you know, we had a lot to say. Uh, Anyway, we'd like to thank you for coming. Uh, Please check out uh, the rest of our, our... Shorely series left over from the summer. We had All Dogs Go to Heaven, Back to the Future, Little Mermaid. What else do we have in there in that uh, collection? Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade and Pet Cemetery. You can catch that on our iTunes feed, or if you want, you can do pull up a quick Google search of the Two True Freaks Network, and you can see our our Shore Leave series there. And you can listen to uh, Chris Honeywell and Dr. Bill Robinson talk about this very episode on Star Trek Monthly Monday. They have a very good opinion. There we go. With that being said, I'd like to say, have a wonderful day. So you're the guest. So Sasha, what is so, Star Trek? Hi, I am the guest. So Sasha, what is Star Trek? <laughs> Seek us out at Next Generation's First Generation, at iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube. Music credits include Electric Car by Poddington Bear, Broke for Free, As Colorful as Ever, Changing by Bortex, In the Woods by Movie Theater, Goodnight Kiss by Movie Theater, to smoke a cigarette by movie theater. Audio engineering by Sasha Shouties. Chief meme maker and episode cover credit goes to Matthew Kirshner. Logo and graphic art design credit goes to David Clawwitter. And special thanks to Patrick Delmore for working with other podcasts to make sure the good word gets out. Do you have a podcast that you think people should be listening to? Send us your promos and we'll play them on the show. If you'd like to email the show, you can email us at nextgenfirstgenpod at gmail.com. I've been Patrick Delmore. And this is Sasha Shouties. Thank you very much for listening and have a wonderful day. Good night.